Hello everybody, it's Edouard Bonnet. I will present a joint work with Eun Jung Kim, Stefan Thomas, and Rémi Latrigan, where we introduce a new graph parameter, twin widths, and use it to solve more efficiently problems that are expressible in first order logic. Let's jump right into it and define twin width. For that, we need to talk about trigraphs and contractions. So a trigraph is simply a graph with two edge sets, black edges that you can think of the normal edges, and red edges that you can think of the error edges. There you can perform a contraction between or identification between two vertices that are not necessarily adjacent. So let's do it with u and v. So we identify u and v into a single vertex and it will affect the colors of the edges incident to uv in the following way. So you see vertices that are na private neighbors of u, like u1 to u3, or private neighbors of v, like v1 to v3. They will be now linked to the contracted vertex uv with a red edge. If you look at the intersection of the neighborhood, that is x1 to x7, there will be a black edge between such a vertex and uv, if and only if it was linked with a black edge to u and to v. Every other combination, a red edge, a black edge, or two red edges, will give a red edge. Now a contraction sequence is the repeated application of this contraction operation until we reach a single vertex. What will be crucial for twin widths is the overall maximum red degree. By red degree of a vertex, I just mean its number of red incident edge. So let's see on this example. We can decide to contract E and F, and this would introduce a red edge to A and to D, because you see that F is linked to A but not to D, and E is linked to D but not to A. Then we can contract maybe A and D and get this trigraph and we can continue until we reach a single vertex. In that contraction sequence, the overall maximum red degree was 2. We never had a vertex with red degree 3 among all those trigraphs. So that would witness that the twin width is at most 2. And in general, the twin widths of a graph will be the least integer d, such that there is a contraction sequence where the overall maximum red degree is d. We'll talk about sequence of d contractions, or d sequences for short. So in this small example, this would witness that the twin width is at most 2, but you could check that the first contraction already had to introduce a vertex with red degree 2. So the twin width of this graph was exactly 2. Later in the talk, we'll see how to solve primes faster when we are given a decontraction sequence or d sequence where d is a constant. So let's see if we can get such a sequence, at least when the input graph is drawn from a simple class of graphs. And we'll start with arguably the simplest class, trees. What we can do in trees is take two leaves with the same parent, two twin leaves, and contract them. So we'll do that whenever possible. Now it's not possible anymore, so we'll have a second rule, which is to take a deepest leaf, let's say this one, and contract it with its parents. So we'll get this trigraph. Again, no twin leaves, so we go with the second rule. And now the first rule kicks in, because we have two leaves that are twins. So we contract them, and so on and so forth. And because we gave precedence to the first rule, it's easy to see that we'll never create a vertex with red degree 3, meaning that trees have twin widths at most 2. We can generalize this to graphs with bounded tree widths, even bounded rank widths or boolean widths. Let's go one step further. Grids, there are examples of graphs with unbounded tree widths, rank widths, but also boolean widths. Could it be that they have constant or bounded twin widths. We'll see that yes, even this graph where I introduced already some error edges has twin widths at most 4. To see that, you can contract the two vertices on top, get this trigraph, and iterate with those two vertices below, and so on. So you see that the red degree is not exceeding 4, and eventually I get the same grid minus one column. So I can iterate this principle until the moment where I reach a red path that I can contract from one endpoint to the other. So this shows that planar grids have twin widths at most 4, 
And this kind of scheme, we can generalize it to d-dimensional grids. They have bounded twin widths where the bound is linear in D, 3D. Let's see an example where there is no good contraction sequence. And the point of this example is to illustrate the fact that twin widths is not exactly iteratively identifying near twins. It's something more restrictive than that. And it's a good thing that it's more restrictive than that because we don't want to capture such a complicated graph. So this is a power set graph. It's a universal bipartite graph. Every bipartite graph appears as an induced subgraph of this thing. Yet you have a contraction sequence where you just identify or contract near twins. You can find those pairs that are differing only on neighbor one. One has it, the other not. And you could extend this into a full contraction sequence. With our definition of twin widths, uh, it would not give a good contraction sequence because vertex 1 would have large red degree. Going back to positive cases, we saw that grids have bounded twin widths. What about planar graphs in general? And here we stumble over the first obstacle. So we could hope to show that planar graphs have bounded twin widths by saying that there is a bound D such that for every planar trigraph with red degree d, there is a contraction of two vertices, preserving both planarity and the fact that the red degree is bounded by d. Unfortunately, this is false. So this is a counterexample of that statement. So here, for every pair of vertices, so every possible contractions that you can perform, either you will lose planarity or the red degree will increase by one. So we need something more if we want to bound the twin widths of planar graphs. This something more is a generalization of ideas in a paper by Guinmo and Marx solving permutation pattern in linear time. So here we want to define a mixed minor. So a T mixed minor would be a T by T division of a matrix such that every cell is complicated in the sense that it's mixed. It's not horizontal nor vertical. It's not the copy of the same row vector nor the copy of the same column vector. And we'll say that the matrix is T mix free if it doesn't have a T mix minor. There is a characterization of bounded twin widths via mix minors. Here I only wrote down the direction that would be useful to bound the twin widths of a graph class. If there is an ordering of the vertex set such that when you write down the adjacency matrix of your graph with that order, the matrix that you get is T mix free doesn't have a t mix minor, then the twin width is bounded by a function of t. So this gives a new avenue to show that the twin width of a class C is bounded. We can find a, an algorithm ordering the vertex set of graphs coming from the class C and argue that using that order, a t mix minor would contradict the simplicity of the class C, the structure of the class C. Let's try that on unit integral graphs. So a natural order is to order the vertices by left endpoints in some unit interval representation. If we do so, the adjacency matrix will look like this. The one entries will be trapped between two non-decreasing curves. And now you can see that you cannot fit a 3x3 three three division that would make all the cells complicated, all the cells mixed, not horizontal nor vertical. Here in the center, not only it's horizontal or vertical, it's both, it's constant. Let's now try on KT minor free graphs, which contain planar graphs in particular. So we'll see just a simple scenario where we would be given a Hamiltonian path. So not only a Hamiltonian path exists, but we are given one, so we don't have to compute it. In that case, we would just order the vertices along the Hamiltonian path. And if we find a T mix minor in the adjacency matrix, it means that in particular we have a T by T division where each cell contains at least one entry one. So because this is a Hamiltonian path, we can contract in the sense of minors 
those segments A1, A2, A3 and do the same with B1, B2, B3 and get a KTT minor. So a KT minor. To make it work in general, we emulate the Hamilton pass by a specifically chosen Lex DFS. Now there are many classes where twin width is bounded and we can find a good contraction sequence in polynomial time. But is it good for something? Can we solve problems faster? As said before, what we can solve faster is first the model checking. So let's see what that is. So in graph FO model checking, you're given a graph and first order sentence, that is a formula without three variables, all the variables are quantified. And this formula is made with the usual first order syntax and can speak about the edges of your graph and can compare vertices. So the universe is the set of vertices. Then you're asking whether your structure, your graph satisfies the sentence phi. So here is an example. So can you find k vertices such that for every vertex, either this vertex is one of the k vertices or it's adjacent to one of those. So this, you may recognize k dominating set. Here is another example. Now again, you want to find k vertices, they need to be pairwise distinct and pairwise non-adjacent. So this is the k independent set problem. On top of that, I want to define FO interpretations and FO transductions. So an FO interpretation is just a way to redefine the edge set by means of a first order formula. So for instance, you can say, now there is an edge between X and Y if there was no edge between X and Y. That would be the complement of your graph. But you can also get the square with the first order formula by saying there is an edge between X and Y if there was an edge between X and Y or if there is a common neighbor to X and Y. If for transductions, they involve first uh, an augmentation of your structure by a constant number of unary relations that comes non-deterministically. So you have a non-deterministic coloring of your graph if you want to think of it like this and now you have an interpretation that can speak about those unary relations it will speak about those unary relations if it's interesting so here i will have like something g to say green that the vertex is green b to say that it's blue r to say that it's red so my formula can now distinguish vertices of different colors same principle the new edge set is defined by a first order formula. I get those edges and now I can remove some vertices that I don't like and I forget about the colors. So that way I get not just one graph but a collection of graphs starting from a single graph because those unary relations, as we said, they, they come non-deterministically. We showed that twin widths behaves particularly well with respect to this notion of transduction. Specifically, if you take any class of bounded twin widths and you apply a transduction, what you get still has bounded twin widths. And this is effective in the sense that if you had a polytime algorithm to find contraction sequences in the initial class, then you still have such an algorithm in the transducted class. We can now define two notions from model theory, initially for infinite structures, but they also make sense for an infinite class of finite structures monadic stability and being monadically nip. So I will drop as an abuse of language the monadically part. So we'll say that a class is stable if there is no transduction getting all ladders, where a ladder is this graph and we want to find the ladder as a semi-induced subgraph, meaning that those edges, what's happening in the bipartition should be induced in the graph, but what's happening in those two sets can be anything. Similarly, a class will be called NIP if there is no transduction that would yield the class of all graphs. To give you some examples, bonded degree graphs are stable, which means that there is no transduction from the class of bonded degree graphs to a class containing all ladders. An alternative definition of stability is to say that you cannot interpret arbitrary long total orders. So the conclusion is that from bonded degree graphs, you cannot interpret those long orders. An example of a class which is not stable, but NIP, is the class of unit interval graphs. Not stable because the ladders actually appear already in the class, without any interpretation, without any transaction. So this ladder, if I add a click here and a click there, this is actually a unit interval graph. 
However, this class is NIP. You cannot get all the graphs with unit interval graphs. This is unlike interval graphs that are not NIP. There is a transduction from interval graphs to the class of all graphs. Bounded twin classes follow the regime of unit interval graphs. They are NIP all the time, but in general not stable. As we saw, they contain unit interval graphs. In general, FOML checking is a hard problem. We cannot expect to solve it in fixed parameter tractable time in the size of the input sentence. However, in some restricted classes of graphs, this is not impossible. So in 96, using Gaffman theorem, Cesar showed how to get an FPT algorithm, so a function of the input sentence times m, the size of the graph, for f model checking on bounded degree graphs. In the following 20 years or so, this result was brought from planar graphs to the more general knower dense classes. For knower dense classes, the result was eventually obtained by Rohr, Kreutzer and Siebert in 2014, with a dependency in the size of the graph, which is slightly worse, but still very close to linear. This was the end of the story for classes that are closed under taking subgraphs. For those classes, tractable if a model checking is synonym of nowhere denseness and also synonym of stability. But it's not the end of the story for classes that are not necessarily closed under taking subgraphs. For instance, there is an ongoing program to lift the results of nowhere dense classes to any transduction of a nowhere dense class. Those classes are still stable, but they are no longer sparse. Let's move on to classes that are NIP, but no longer stable. For bounded rank width graphs, not only FO model checking is efficiently solvable, but a large fragment of MSO is. So this is a result by Corsell, Makovsky and Rutich. The algorithm of GIM1 marks is not solving the whole FO model checking, but a large fragment of it, namely subgraph isomorphism. There is such a result for posets of bounded width by Gajorski et al. And back to stable classes on map graphs. So map graphs, they are dense. I put them with sparse classes because they can be interpreted from sparse structures. Again, such an FPT algorithm is known by Ekmeyer and Kawara Bayashi. Now, bounded twin widths sits here. So it's generalizing bounded rank widths, posets of bounded widths, so posets with anti-chains of bounded size, permutations avoiding a fixed pattern, so this is for the dense world, but also a part of the sparse or stable world with a generalization of map graphs and also of KT minor free graphs, proper minor closed classes. Now I put this dash dotted line here, it's because for all we know, bounded twin widths could generalize polynomial expansion. Whereas we do know that bounded twin width classes are incomparable with bounded degree, bounded expansion, or nowhere dense classes. The main result of the paper is an FPT algorithm in the size of the input sentence and a bound on a given D sequence. So our algorithm has to be fed with a D sequence of the graph where D is a constant. This we cannot find in general graphs, but we can find for at least those classes that you see are generalized by bounded twin widths. All right, so our FO model checking algorithm needs, in addition to the input graph, a contraction sequence. We saw two ways of getting such a sequence, either directly. We saw the example of trees and grids and said that it was generalizable to wider classes. And if this fails, if there is no obvious way of finding directly the contraction sequence, we can just find an order such that when we write the adjacency matrix, we get a matrix which is mixed minor free. And from there, there is an efficient algorithm to output the contraction sequence. So we saw the example of KT minor free graphs. Once we get the graph and the sequence, our algorithm works like this. So it's first totally oblivious of the input sentence. It's building a very large tree that we call morphism tree that contains all the answers to queries of the form does my input graph G 
satisfy the sentence phi, where phi is in prenex normal form and of quantifier depth L. Prenex normal form means that the, all the quantifiers are put at the beginning of the sentence, followed by a quantifier-free formula. If we treat L and D as constants, the algorithm takes linear time. However, the complexity in L is huge. It's a tower of exponentials of height and centrally L. Nevertheless, this dependency is unavoidable, even for trees. Now let's have a brief look at how the FO model checking algorithm works. We'll take the partitioning viewpoint of a contraction sequence. By that I mean that instead of seeing a vertex here as one vertex, we remember that it corresponds to a subset of vertices in the initial graph. Now the algorithm can be described as dynamic programming, maintaining theories among Prenex sentences of quantifier depth at most L that are local to the red graph. By red graph, I mean the graph induced by the red edges only. And by local, I mean the following. Sentences that will be rooted at a given vertex slash vertex set in the current trigraph. It will mean that the first variable of the sentence has to be instantiated to some vertex within that set. And local means that we'll consider the structure only at a given distance of this vertex in the red graph. As in Geffman theorem, this distance can be taken as 3 to the L. Now, initially, there is no red edge, so the red components are singletons, and computing local theories is simple. Eventually, we grouped all the vertex set of G into a single vertex, so the local theory of that vertex actually contains the global theory, so to speak, of G. Therefore, it all boils down to computing the new local theories once we perform one contraction. So let's say we contract x12 and x8, and we get the following new trigraph. The local theories, or morphism trees, which need an update, are at distance at most 3 to the L of the newly contracted vertex, x16. So they are here, the blue vertices. Now to update the morphism tree, we need to look again at distance 3 to the L, so the green vertices, and aggregate all those morphism trees and then reduce it so that the size of the morphism trees is not slowly increasing. Now the correctness of the algorithm is a mix between arguments in Gaffman theorem and the fact that if there is no edge or a black edge between two parts, it's homogeneous. So this would be a biclick and this would be an anti-complete relation. So basically, the precise positions of vertices within that set and within that set are irrelevant. Finally, and this is crucial for the running time, the red graph has degree at most d. So the number of blue and green vertices, the number of morphism trees to aggregate, is bounded by a function of d and l only. The most pressing open question is to compute twin widths in general graphs. Of course, we don't expect this problem to be easy, but for the purposes of what we saw in this talk, being able to approximate within a constant factor twin widths in graphs where we're given the promise that the twin widths is bounded by a constant would be enough. Now, there is this question of fully classifying classes where FO model checking is fixed parameter tractable. It could be that all classes that are NIP admit such an algorithm. Now, the best explanation that we have for stable classes is the result on nowhere dense classes. And for classes that are NIP but not stable is twin widths. So is there a unification of those two classes that would shed more light on this question? This is very open. I thank you for your attention. And if you enjoyed this talk and if you're interested, there is more on archive.